So what we're going to talk about today is gravitational fields and gravitational field strength. Okay. Uh, something is considered to be a field force if it can exert a force in an area of influence without physical contact. So friction is contact force. Tension is a contact force. Normal force is a contact force. Okay? All of those require you to actually be in physical contact, either directly or indirectly, with the object. Okay? Does everyone kind of follow me on those contact forces? Okay. Field forces can be exerted over an area. So gravity. Right? If I'm orbiting the Earth, I'm still having a force of gravity exerted on me by Earth, even though I'm not in physical contact with the ground. Okay? If I'm falling, I jump off a diving board. I don't suddenly just float in the air like Wiley the Coyote does when he you know, runs off the cliff. Okay? Because gravity is a field force, and it can still exert a force on me without actually touching me. Okay? It can pull anyway. Right? Electricity is another field force. Okay? So you can have electric fields, and you can have magnetic fields. Right? Both of those are field forces, areas of influence. Have you ever seen, probably in elementary school, maybe your, your teacher put like a bar magnet on a piece of paper and threw iron filings around it? And even though the iron filings aren't in contact with the uh, magnet, they would make a shape around it. Okay? And it would kind of outline where the bar magnet's magnetic field is. Okay? So they can still exert a force, can still turn them and orient, but even though it's not touching. Okay, so field forces are forces that have an area of influence and they don't have to be in physical contact. The thing about field forces, their ability to exert force diminishes exponentially with distance. Okay, so as I get further and further away from Earth, I will feel exponentially less gravitational field strength and less gravitational force on me due to the Earth. Okay, I'm all right with that idea. All right, so gravity is a field because it exerts a force without being in physical contact, and gravitational field strength is numerically equal to acceleration due to gravity at any given point. So the Earth's gravitational field strength on its surface is on average 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Does that sound weird? Every other time you've heard that, you've heard it as meters per second squared, yes? Well, newtons per kilogram, okay, what are the units for newtons? Kilogram meters per second squared. So if I go newtons per kilogram, what happens to the kilograms? They cancel. Newton per kilogram is a meter per second squared. I know it seems weird to not say it that way, but when we're talking about gravitational field strength, what we're saying is it would be this many newtons worth of force for every kilogram of mass. It just happens to be exactly the same as the acceleration due to gravity at that point. Okay. All right. So the Earth and the Moon. They interact with each other because they are both caught in each other's gravitational field. Now, the moon's gravitational field is obviously the smaller of the two because of the moon's size. Yeah, it's smaller mass. Okay? The moon is considerably smaller than the Earth. Okay? And even though the moon is large as far as moons go, it's actually quite light as far as moons go. Okay? And the reason for that is the way it was formed. Right? Anyone know how the moon was formed? Yeah. It was part of the Earth. Okay? It was created in a massive impact between Earth and another protoplanet during the early formation of the solar system. About a Mars-sized object or so collided with Earth about four point something billion years ago. Okay? And in the process, okay, because it wasn't a, like it wasn't a direct hit, okay, it wasn't a head-on collision, okay, it was kind of like this, kind of a glancing blow. So it struck the Earth and basically stripped the Earth's surface right off. 
okay, and threw a big cloud of debris around the Earth as a result. Okay, the impactor was essentially absorbed. Okay, its surface would have also been vaporized and chucked into a cloud in orbit around the Earth. So there actually would have been a ring system around the Earth for a short period of time, short geologic period of time. Okay, um, and so we've got um, basically just the surface materials of the Earth being able to coalesce and form the moon, okay? which is why the moon's surface, or all of the moon, and the Earth's surface are nearly identical in both age and composition. And we know this because we went to the moon and we brought samples back with us, so that's why we know that. Okay? So if you think the moon landing was faked, once again I'm going to say crazy on that end. Yeah, okay? we have samples okay, that we brought back. So what is the moon? The moon is essentially made of the same, like so silicone and things like that. So the stuff that, uh, the mineral composition of the Earth's surface and the composition of the moon are nearly identical. The moon, on the other hand, does not have a solid iron core like Earth does. Okay, and so that's usually a sign that it was made from other materials and not around the same time as the Earth because the Earth was able to collect a lot of the iron in the area. Okay, and it would have absorbed the iron core of the impactor as well, because in that impact, it would have all liquefied, and the dense iron stuff would have collected in the middle, and the lighter minerals and silicates, they float to the top, form the crust and mantle and all that. Does that make sense? Okay, so as it, as it sits now, the moon is orbiting the Earth, okay? It's getting a little further away all the time. Okay, we said about two centimeters a year, so you don't have to worry about losing it in your lifetime. Okay, but it is doing that. Okay, but its gravitational field overlaps the Earth, and the Earth's obviously overlaps the Moon. Okay, that's what keeps it in orbit around the Earth. Now, something about that orbit. We do simplify the orbital mechanics of Earth and the Moon a lot. And we just say the Moon orbits the Earth, the center of the Earth. Is that true? The Earth and the Moon actually orbit a common gravitational center that is just below the Earth's surface. So, Moon goes around the Earth, and Earth tries to orbit that point that's actually inside of itself, which causes the Earth to wobble back and forth as it goes around the Sun. Okay, so it does this weird wobbly thing. Okay, so imagine like a top, but it's not balanced. If you try to spin it, it would wobble like crazy because it's not balanced. Or if you have a tire, then it's not balanced, and we get to a certain speed, it wobbles like crazy, it makes the whole car shake. It's exactly the same idea. Okay, the Earth wobbles back and forth in its orbit because of the overlapping gravitational fields. Okay, hear that? So. Michael Faraday, you may remember him from Science 10. He's the guy who invented the first generator. Okay? He worked with magnetic fields and electrical fields. Okay? He invented the concept of the field to explain how magnets attract objects, and later the field concept was applied to both electricity and gravity. Okay? Anything that has mass is surrounded by a gravitational field. That gravitational field is linearly related to the mass of the object. Right? So, um, if I were to double my mass, which would not be good for me, but if I did, okay, my gravitational field strength would double. Okay? If Earth was twice as heavy as it is, its gravitational field strength would double. That would be unpleasant. Okay? Because we'd be twice as heavy as normal, okay, walking around on the Earth. Okay? If you weighed 150 pounds, you'd feel like you weighed 300 pounds. It's a lot harder. Okay? All right. Um, I'm okay with that idea. Okay, so Earth's gravitational field, okay, is actually pretty big, and for all intents and purposes, it doesn't end. It just gets exponentially weaker to the point where it basically has no effect. Okay, the Sun's gravitational field, on the other hand, does exactly the same thing, but the Sun is millions of times heavier than Earth, so its gravitational field extends further in a practical sense. Okay, so we've got you know, the planets, and then we have the Kuiper belt, where things like Pluto are, okay? and then we have the Oort cloud, where comets hang out occasionally, and then beyond that is kind of the interstellar space that goes between stars. Okay? The, Earth, the sun's gravitational field extends out a very, very long way. 
anything that can be attracted to the sun gravitationally is said to be caught in the sun's gravitational field or falling into the sun's gravity well. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's heard that term before, but gravity well is something they often use in science fiction, and they use it to describe how things fall towards another object gravitationally. So they represent space instead of in three dimensions, in two dimensions, and something's gravity well would be shaped like this underneath it. And if anything fell or got close to the Earth, it might fall down the well, okay, due to Earth's gravity. So sometimes it's visualized that way. All right, so to find the strength of a gravitational field, put a small body of known mass in the field and measure the force that acts on it. Okay, then we define the field strength, the little g, the acceleration due to gravity, to be the force divided by the units of mass. So essentially what we have is if we want to kind of derive this formula, this is what we do. We say m times g is equal to this. Okay, could I say that that's true? Absolutely. Okay. It's the force of gravity. It better equal itself. Okay? It's just from two different points of view. So if I want to calculate the gravitational field strength or acceleration due to gravity at any point, okay, I just have to plug in my numbers. Now what's going to happen to the smaller mass? Right, is that important? Because we learned that all things fall at the same rate regardless of their mass. Okay? So any body, regardless of its mass, caught in the field at a certain point would have the same g. Okay? Is that ringing a bell for everybody? Okay? So the formula we're dealing with here to calculate gravitational field strength looks very much like Newton's universal law of gravitation. It's just missing an m. Okay? Because it's not calculating the force of gravity, it's calculating the acceleration due to gravity, okay? which are two different things. Now, I make a point of that because on your unit exam, there will be a question on gravitational field strength that will require you to use this formula. And in that question, I will have the words gravitational field strength bold-faced, italicized, and underlined. And one-third of you will do this. and calculate the force of gravity, even though the question clearly says gravitational field strength. I only say that because I don't want history to repeat itself. I want someone to break the cycle. Please. Okay? Because this is like Groundhog Day. You guys ever seen that movie? I say this every year when I teach this lesson. I do this, I tell them to be bold face italicized and underlined, and one third of the class still does it this way, even when they're warned. It's sad. So read the question here. Okay? All right. So what we see here, okay, is all these lines, okay, all these arrows that are denoting the gravitational field strength, and we see that it gets stronger, obviously, the closer to the center of the ma more massive body we get. Okay? Now, that's if it's just one mass. What if we're talking about Earth and the moon? Would it change what that looks like? Because the moon also has what? It has mass. It has a gravitational field. Okay? So what would happen is it would alter. Okay? And now, sure, anything on this side, opposite the moon, okay, looks perfectly normal. But over here, we can see that the moon is now starting to change the direction and magnitude of that gravitational field. Okay. Um, so when they were sending astronauts to the moon, which they did, okay, was this something they would have had to consider? Yeah, you don't want to have the engines on all the way there. Because if you do, you're going to go zipping right on by, because you're going to hit that kind of balance point where all right, now there's no net gravitational field, and then suddenly you're accelerating towards the moon because of the moon's gravity. 
Okay? And remember, they didn't go like this. Okay? They didn't go straight to the moon. They aimed for where the moon would be. Because okay? it took them several days to get there, and the moon was in motion while they do it. So they actually kind of did something like this, and they had a, more of a curved path that allowed them to fall into orbit in the gravity well of the moon, okay? and then obviously go down to the surface. But they had to take into account that they weren't having to push as hard to get away from Earth's gravity, and at one point they would be caught in the moon's gravity, and they would actually have to slow down. Okay, so when they were trying to fall into orbit around the moon, they would actually flip the spacecraft over and point the engines at the moon and thrust back towards the Earth in order to slow down. Okay. All right, everybody okay with that idea? All right, so is this formula here going to be fairly straightforward to use? Yeah, that means no different than using the... the uh, Universal law of gravitation. It's very similar to that, manipulated in the same way. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. Okay, um, we already talked about that. Okay. All right, I want you to calculate. Um, so do what we just did here, but do it for both the Earth and the Moon. Okay, I want you to do this m times g equals big G times m1 times m2 over r squared. I want you to do that for both the Earth and the Moon, okay? Using the information on your formula sheet. So um, they use 5.97 here. We use 5.98, and we use 7.35, and we use 7.36. And we use 7.37, 6.37, okay? So I want you to calculate the gravitational field strength on Earth and on the Moon using the numbers that we have there. So, okay, mass of the Moon, radius of the Moon, mass of Earth, radius of the Earth. See what you get. I mean, what should we get for Earth? Yeah, a, around 9.8. It's not going to be exactly 9.8, but it's going to be close. Okay, so if we're looking at this for Earth, okay, uh, we would punch it in like so. So 6.67 e negative 11 times the mass of the Earth, okay, and then we would divide that by the radius of the Earth because we'd be standing on its surface squared. All right, so we get 9.83 meters per second squared, or newtons per kilogram, instead of 9.81. Why? So why do we use 9.81 then? Because it's not pushing directly to the moon. Yeah, it's more of an average, okay? Um, whereas we're using here the average Earth radius. 6.37 times 10 to the 6 is the average Earth radius, and Earth's not perfectly spherical. Okay? So we get slightly different numbers when we do that, okay? based on the surface of the Earth, the shape of the Earth, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, if we do this for the Moon, okay, we do it very similarly, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, okay, times now the mass of the Moon, 7.36 times 10 to the 22, okay? and then we divide that by the radius of the Moon, which is 1.74 times 10 to the 6 squared. Okay, so instead we get 1.6 newtons per kilogram, which is about one-sixth of Earth. Okay. And if you've ever seen any footage of the astronauts on the surface of the moon, okay, they actually had to train themselves to walk differently, okay, or to move differently on the moon's surface because if they tried to walk like they did on Earth, they would um, almost like bound up into the air and there was a risk that they could fall. And if they fell, they could break their face plate or puncture their suit. So they actually shuffled a lot on the moon, okay? Or did these kind of little bunny hop kind of things where they moved more laterally than, than straight up and down, okay? Because if they did that, like I said, they could have um, started a rotation effect because the gravity is one sixth of it. 
Okay? Even wearing that big heavy suit, they were considerably lighter. Okay? There's actually like, videos of them jumping, like stationary jumping on the moon, and like getting incredible air, even though they're wearing these big, inflexible heavy suits. Yeah. Actually, sorry, go wait for it. Yeah. All right. Questions on how that one works? Um, like with the astronauts, when yeah. they're jumping in the seats, would it feel like, like very heavy or no? Um, well, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. I mean, it's still there. It's like awkward to jump in, but no. It, when they wear them on Earth, it's like, you know, it's like crushing, but on the moon, not so much because the moon's gravity doesn't pull on it nearly as bad. Okay. Um, Okay, here's one that I've put on a unit exam as a multiple, cho multiple choice question a number of times, and it'll snag a large number of people. Okay, so you got a person standing on Mars, got a person standing on Earth. Okay, what's the mass of a 60 kilogram student on Mars? 60 kilograms. What's your mass a measure of? That's your weight. And that's what people think of in this question, right? They go, oh, what's the mass of a 60 kilogram student? And they go 60 times whatever the gravitational acceleration is. And they calculate what Fg is. Fg is weight. It's the force of gravity. Your mass is how much of you there is. It doesn't matter where you go. There's the same amount of you. Okay? If you're 60 kilograms on Earth, you're 60 kilograms in space, you're 60 kilograms on Mars, on the moon, doesn't matter where you go, you have a mass of 60 kilograms. That's how much of you there is, and that doesn't change. What changes is how much gravity there is to pull on that 60 kilograms worth of mass. So your weight, which is the second part, can change from place to place, but your mass will not. Right. That makes sense. That's just one of those things. Like I use, if I put that anywhere, I put it on the final because I talk to you about weight and mass in two different units. Okay, so that's one of those ones. Make sure we know the difference between weight and mass. Okay. All right. I want you guys to try a couple from the digital workbook. I'm just going to call it up. We're going to work on a few of those, and then I think we'll start. The assignment I was going to give you tomorrow, we'll start it today and have tomorrow. So there's really no excuse to have it for homework. Okay, so here's the gravitational fields worksheet, okay? And it's got nine questions on it. So let's get started on those, okay? And then we'll go through any that give you trouble. We probably won't get, we probably won't do them all because they're all pretty straightforward. Okay, so work on those for a little bit and then we'll, uh, I'll explain the assignment for you. So as we saw there, okay, we already know the moon is tidally locked. That's why we only see one side of it. Okay, we can also see just from that whole like vector components thing that they showed us how the moon is pulling or slowing the Earth's rotation down. Okay, so you have to imagine back when the moon first formed, okay, and they're saying four billion years ago, the moon or the Earth would spin around and around in 12 hours. So a day lasted half as long as it lasts now. Okay. You also have to consider that the moon went around the Earth a lot more often. It didn't take 27 days. It was probably a couple of times per day. Okay. So imagine watching the moon go up and down, up and down in the sky several times a day, kind of like the International Space Station does. Okay. Uh, so we would, it would be very, very different. And with the moon going around that much more often, early on, it would have slowed the Earth's rotation more than it does now. Okay, as it's moving further and further away, the force it exerts gets 
smaller and smaller. Okay? So the effect would have been greatly exaggerated early in Earth's history, but be less obvious now because the, the moon is considerably further away now than it was then. Well, that's when I think the light moves. Well, if the Earth isn't moving, like isn't spinning, and the same side always faces the, the moon, the oceans would just permanently move that way. There'd be nothing to kind of make them go the other way because it would always be exerting the same force. But because the moon, the Earth is rotating under the moon, okay, different parts of the ocean are being pulled towards the moon as the, as the different face of the Earth faces it, right? So it would affect the tides in that there wouldn't really be any anymore. All right, I'm going to give you guys about a five minute break here. So let's say back here, one fifth. Well, you can't leave, but we'll be back up here at 1.15. I'll give you your assignment sheets and we'll get started on that. Get you an extra half an hour to work on that.